Shalom everybody out there. This is Jared Jacobs with Cradle of Hope Ministries and we are going to continue with the lesson that we've been going over the series called The Time of Jacob's Trouble. Um, so let me go ahead. I even got my notes pulled up. Um, there's a couple things I want to bring up. Always check the links in the description um, because we're going to have, we have the leadership of the ministry. There's a couple of blog radio channels um, that are available that they minister on each week and I really want to encourage everybody to um, go down and, and be able to look at those each and every week. We always have the links in the description for that and then also we want to call out that the quarterly meetings that we have, um, the next one will be July and if you click on that link that's in the description that says you know attend the next quarterly meeting or attend the next live meeting, um, it will take you to our website and you'll get the information there. And it's really important that you guys really kind of prioritize coming to these quarterly meetings, if possible, um, to be able to fellowship with everybody and experience the power of God's anointing. So, with this lesson, go to 2 Peter chapter 3. There's a few pictures I want to come up and start with. Um, and, you know, I kind of like doing this because um, it keeps things interesting. But there, uh, last time we were talking about um, a particular person back in 2011 that was that kind of took the country by storm and was convincing the church that the rapture was going to happen on May the 21st. This is back in 2011. So I alluded to it, we talked about it, but I want to bring this back up because we're going to touch on this in the beginning of this lesson. And it shows you um, when we talk about strong delusion and deception and being turned over um, to believe a lie, this is uh, evidence from our recent past of this happening. People really believed on this day judgment was going to come, the rapture was going to take place, and God, uh, the tribulation and all those things were going to happen. And so we'll kind of thumb through a few of these. I mean, these are real people. This really happened and it's happening today. And I want to call this out because as we go through these scriptures, I want you to have these images in your mind that this is real. Scripture, as I said last week, and prophecy is being fulfilled before our very eyes. But if you don't know what to look for, if you don't have revelation knowledge coming from the throne room through the prophets coming to you, then you can get swept up into some of these things. Okay? So again, this never happened. It's not going to happen this way. And we will get into scripturally as you turn to 2 Peter chapter 3, what will happen in this time known as the tribulation or the time of Jacob's trouble, okay? And it, it's something that you really need to think about is, you know, why is it, how, what are the odds that you and I, out of all the billions and billions of angelic beings out there in the spirit world, how we were chosen to be here at this time. We were predestinated from the foundations of the world to be here during this time. And we're going to experience these things. And we're going to have an opportunity to walk through it gloriously if we comply with what God's Word is telling us to do. So, 2 Peter chapter 3, I will start in verse 3. The time of Jacob's trouble. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. Now, this individual, these images that I just showed you, this guy was a scoffer. He was coming out. He was proclaiming things. Um, and he was walking after the lust of his own thoughts and mind. He, he, what he did is he actually thought that he mathematically created a formula to know exactly when the Lord Yeshua was going to return to this earth. Even though scripture tells us, you know, no man knoweth the day or the hour. And they even asked Yeshua a lot of these questions and he said, only my father knows these things. But yet, after his own lust, this man thought he, he had calculated the exact date, year, uh, and time that it was going to take place. And uh, of course it did not. Verse 4. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? And that's exactly what he was doing. He's proclaiming through his little formula that he put together, whatever it was that he used, mathematics, numbers, whatever, he was proclaiming the promise of the Lord's coming by what he was doing, whether he knew that or not. And I see every year, you know, Christian ministers come up with elaborate scenarios of of different ways of them trying to convince the people that the rapture is going to take place. It's imminent at any point in time. And we're going through this series and showing scripturally that that's not truth. We know that after certain events, after the tribulation will happen, then the Lord will come. We'll touch on that here in a few minutes. Again, so it says, For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. 
Now, this pertains to people that believe that tomorrow will always be as it is today. I don't need to worry about the doom and gloom stuff that you guys are talking about. I don't need to worry about that. Jesus is going to take care of me. Everything is going to be just like it is today and as it was yesterday. And that's, these are the Bible is speaking about people that I talk to and people that email me and send me messages all the time. Verse 5, for they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God, the heavens are of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. So here's the problem. There's like three groups of people that I'm dealing with right now. There are people that think that there may be a God, and especially in this area of Austin that I'm in, there are a lot of those out here. People that don't even believe that God is real. He could be real, but they're not quite sure. We already know those people are in trouble. Then there's this second group that most of the people that, that are in the church are kind of in, where they believe that these things will they will happen. The events that we're going to talk about today and some that we've touched on in terms of the, 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 the destruction and the things that are coming, the bowls of wrath, they know those things are going to happen because it's in the Word. They just don't believe it's going to happen to them or the rapture is going to take them off of this earth so that they don't have to be here when these things happen. That's the deception. That's the dangerous part, the dangerous mindset to have in these last days. Because when you have that mindset, you don't think there needs to be any preparation on your part. You don't need to, like like when God pulled Lot out of Sodom and, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, people today don't think they need to leave. They don't need to physically do anything. They don't need to put up food. They don't need to store up water or put away uh, gold and silver or leave their homes, or leave this country. They don't believe that's necessary. That's the danger. That's the deception that we're trying to warn people about. And that third group is the actual remnant, and we'll get scripturally into this remnant um, today and some next week on who those people actually are. How do you identify the remnant? What are the, the characteristics and the description of the people known as the remnant in the Bible? We'll get to that. So you know you're being a lullaby to sleep, when you believe that no harm is going to come in the last days, and because you're a Christian, the 91st Psalm is going to protect you. Prophet used to make a lot of people angry. When you actually go in and you read Psalms 91, and you understand who that was being spoken by and who that was being spoken to, it was to people that were keeping the Holy Covenant. That's who, it was, that's who that Psalms 91 protects. That's who it's uh, in operation for. And we're going to get, again, we're going to get into these things scripturally. Let me bring up another image because we're going to get into uh, the time of the end, okay? More of the things that you're going to see and I have already seen um, in that time. So, hold on, let me roll this up so I'll make it big so you guys can see it. Let me read a couple of notes here. All right, bear with me. Now, on December 2nd, most a lot of us were young. December 2nd, 1989, President Bush Sr., as you see in the image, and Mikhail Gorbachev, okay, was a Russian leader at that time in the 80s, late 80s, they started talks about a new world order. Now, being the 2000, 2016, the time we're in now, everybody's heard this term before, but what we're doing is we're going back and we're showing you the origins of where this began to become public, where the Word of God, the Scriptures, the prophecies that we're reading began to come out publicly to the people. Okay, Now, most of you have heard the phrase New World Order. What is that about? It is about a one-world economy. It is about a one-world government. And it is about a one-world religion. It's about the time of the end. Okay, These are things that are happening. Now, you guys, most, some of you may know this, some of you don't. On that date, that's when President Bush came before the nation and he began to say, we're moving towards a new world order. This is almost, you know, 20, what is it, 25, almost 30 years ago that this happened, okay? God's word rolling out right in front of our very eyes. Now, are these people, okay, these people that call themselves the elite, the Illuminati, are these people so educated in the word of God that they know how to pull all of this together? No, they are being driven by their spirits. These are children of darkness being driven by their spirit man to do exactly what the Lord God is allowing darkness to do, to bring this thing to an end, to fulfill the word of God. That's what they're here. Their destiny is to complete the new world order, is to bring down the world economies and bring down governments and consolidate everything under a global rule, under a man named or be called the Antichrist. 
That is their destiny. Just like your destiny is to be part of the remnant, to be the part of those that are saved, to go back to the land and repopulate the, the kingdom of God as Yeshua returns to this earth. Destinies, the children of light, the children of darkness, and the children of this world. Okay, let me bring the video back. That's what's going on. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, please. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We are in the last transition that is going to be on this earth. And I'm trying to bring um, evidence of stuff that's happened in the past. So you can see I showed you some images on, on magazines of newspaper clippings. This stuff is happening. And the, the, we're having a hard time trying to get the church to see that. Because Ephraim is in the church, most of them. Most of the church is Ephraim. And we're trying to wake them up to the fact that the peace, peace, and the prosperity, and you don't have any worries message that's going on in these mega churches is exactly opposite to what's going on in real life. Okay? And that's what we're trying to wake these people up. I mean, the church era is over. I mean, you say these things, and it's hard to process those type of statements. But in order for there to be a transition, God have already predestinated the time where the, 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 the Sanhedrin of our day, the mega churches of our time are no longer doing and moving in the direction that the Father wants. So he has to move and start something over. And that's the process that we're in. And it's the last process that of, of that nature that's going to happen. And that's what we're trying to get people to understand. God never leaves anybody behind. People leave themselves behind. Please understand that. God isn't leaving anyone behind. He's giving people a chance. As this message is moving through America, as Prophet Decker went through cities all over uh, the U.S. and he's been places all over the world, as the, as the ten prophets in this ministry are pushing this message out there, people are having their time of visitation. As subtle as it may look, literally their chance to become part of the remnant and to be saved out of it all, as we read in the first scripture of the very first part of this series, their time of visitation, their opportunity to say yes or no is passing in front of their face before their very eyes and they don't understand. See, the, the problem is, is that we want an angel of God to show up in our homes or in front of our faces and say, hello, I'm from the Lord God, and I'm telling you, you need to get with Prophet Todd and Cradle of Hope, and you need to get into this movement. You've been chosen. And the spirit side just doesn't work that way. It doesn't. You have to know it's a heart thing. That's why many of you Ephraimites that have tried to tell your friends, you've tried to tell family members, you've tried to tell uh, your pastor or church people about what it is you're learning and what you're excited about, and yet they're just not able to grab a hold of it. You can't, even though you bring the scriptures, even though y'all argue back and forth on your points of view, you've got to understand that it's got to be in the heart. It's got to be in you from the foundations of the world to be a part of this. And that's why time and time again, Prophet would say, you know, you've got to marry within the tribes. You've got to do this because the odds of you pulling somebody into this, uh, you know, arguing them into it, and, you know, that's just zero because the remnant is so small of a percentage of the people that is on this earth. That's why you guys have to understand the odds of us coming together like this, the odds of us hooking up with these prophets like this and just being by chance, those odds are zero. You're here. You're hearing this. This is your time of visitation, just like it was my time of visitation. Grab a hold of it. Don't let go because the powers of darkness are here to convince you through the lust of the eye, through the lust of the flesh, through the pride of life, that maybe this ain't what you thought it was when you grabbed a hold to it at first. You want to let that go and go after something else. Beware of that, Ephraim, because they come to steal, to kill, and destroy. Okay? So again, the spirit side is not going to work that way. Um, hopefully you're in 2 Thessalonians 2. The just shall live by faith, not by visions, not by dreams. You're going to have to, I mean, those things do happen. Don't get me wrong. But if, if that's the, the totality of your guidance system and not the word of God and not fasting and prayer and stepping out in faith, then that's how you can get into the position that most of the church is in right now, being led by a familiar spirit, a seducing spirit that is catering to their itching ears, wanting to hear something that's deception in these last days. 
Okay, there's always been a prophet. There's always been a, or an apostle that's there to hear from the throne room and to teach the people and tell the people the direction they need to go. We're not outside the scripture here in the way God has done things over and over again. All right, Second Thessalonians chapter two. I'm going to start in the first verse. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as the day of Christ is at hand. Okay, stay with me. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, the day of Christ, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So we need to examine this because um, we're seeing, you know, we're understanding you, got, you can't be shaken over this. Some things that you need to understand that have to transpire, okay, just like the, the rapture now and Yeshua returning at any moment. No, there's things that have to happen, and we're going through some of these things. So don't let anybody trick you. Don't let anybody deceive you. The day of Christ and the conclusion of the tribulation and his return will not come unless there first be a falling away, all right, from the church and an Antichrist be revealed. Now, Paul and the arrest of the apostles, this is 2,000 years ago, were concerned about people being drawn away by enticing doctrines. Okay, today people are running around getting excited. Um, there's all kind of unsound doctrines being preached. I mean, um, you guys, I mean, Prophet used to always talk about the, the gold dust that are in these meetings that's coming from the ceilings as the Lord was supposedly to show up and gold dust would just fall or diamonds would appear in these meetings. All these winds of doctrine, is that scriptural? No. Uh, yeah, I've actually heard from uh, people that were privy to the information. There are people in the air ducts dumping, that, dumping the dust into the air ducts to make the people believe it was God putting the gold dust out there. They were even concerned about those things back in the days of the apostles. Deception, something outside of the word, something that's exciting and things that have people with itching ears grabbing a hold of and running after. Deception has been around. It's been a concern for the, for, for the leadership of, of God's people. Okay, So again, the falling away, and I can tell you that prophetically, this is what Prophet said, that that falling away process started even around the time of the book of Acts. That time began of people falling away and doctrines coming in and with the Catholic Church and what they came in and did with changing the Sabbath and changing the Word of God and melting together paganism, pagan holidays with Christian holidays. That falling away took place in the apostolic age and it's coming to a finality in the times that we're in right now. The falling away, people coming out of the church and we're trying to give them a time of visitation so that they can come in to the movement of God of these last days and not go on out into the world. Stay tuned. We're going to come back to that. Verse 4. Who opposeth and exalted himself, this is the Antichrist, above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This is what this man is going to do. Please understand, yes, this man is walking the earth right now. Yes, that his rise to power has already been televised. He's here. And these are the things that he is going to do, and we are going to watch these things happen. So this man is going to come on the scene, or he is on the scene, and everyone's going to love him. He's going to draw millions in the crowds. They're going to come. He's got such eloquent speech. He's so captivating in his personality, and he's going to be loved by everyone around this world. So... As this man comes forth, he's going to talk about uh, in the time that we're coming in the near future. I don't know how near, but in the time of our lifetime, we're going to see that the peace treaty with Israel is going to come forth. That he's going to say the economy is going to be fixed. The prices of gas and food are going to come down. All of these exorbitant prices because of the, the, the collapse of these world economies, we're going to come down. The prices are going to be where everybody wants them. It's comfortable. People got money in their pockets. Everything is going to be fixed. This man is going to have all the answers, and everybody's going to grab a hold of that, and he's going to be loved by every person on this world, in this world that's not written in the book of life. We'll come to that, and he's going to convince everyone that we need a one-world money system. Okay. Now, at some point in the future, he's going to take over the godhood on this earth. 
where he's going to be erected and praised to such a high pinnacle in people's minds and hearts that the people that aren't saved are going to call him the Messiah, the second coming of, of the real Christ. That is how this man is going to be worshipped and exalted. Stay tuned. Verse 5, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know that what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time, and we're at that time now, for the the ministry of or the mystery, excuse me, of iniquity doth already work. Only he that who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now, P Paul is talking about the time of the Antichrist coming out. That last part when it says that he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. This is talking about the archangel Michael, and the Father is going to speak. And Michael, who's holding back a lot of this tribulation, a lot of these things that are going to happen, he's going to be removed out of the way, and God is going to permit darkness to go on and fulfill that which he's spoken. Okay, that's what that scripture is talking about. Go to verse 8. And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So we see that the Lord is going to return to this earth again, after all of these events have taken place, and he's going to destroy the son of perdition, this man named the Antichrist. Okay? Now, do we know the time of the Lord's coming? Let me throw up another image. Do we know that timing? Present to everyone. There we go. Yes, we do. Now, what you're looking at, bring my notes back up. I do this slow. I cut it off one time. Uh, what you're looking at is called the Valley of Megiddo. Okay, this is a valley where the great war, as we all know, of Armageddon will take place in the future. That valley is about 200 miles long, and when this war takes place, so much death will happen. The Bible says that the blood will run bridle high, meaning the horse, you know, the horse has the bridle around his mouth, that the blood will run bridle high in that valley. That's about, what, five feet tall? Some of you people that are a little bit uh, vertically challenged, maybe five foot one or two, the blood would come up to your eyeballs. That's how much death is going to happen in this great war that's going to happen in this valley of Megiddo around um, Israel. Okay, We know that when that valley, when that war comes, the Lord will come down. He will come at that time, and he will set everything straight and will be in business. OK, we'll probably come. I'll talk more about that as we get to uh, the end of this series on kind of the progression of events up into Yeshua coming back to the earth and us being gathered back to the land of Israel, so on and so forth. We'll get there. But stick with me on this. Verse nine, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power. Talking about this Antichrist man that's already here. He's going to be after the working of Satan with all power and signs and line wonders. Now here's a problem. We preach and teach all the time that in order for God to uh, manifest himself with the power of his anointing in our services, our meetings, you have to be a clean vessel, which means you have to walk in holiness and righteousness, you have to fast, you have to have the scripture in your heart, you're going to have to, all this material that we have is going to be in your life and in operation, all right, most of it, in order for God to use you to bring the power of his anointing. That isn't in the churches right now. Because of the things that I've named, they don't even care about those things for the most part. So when this Antichrist man appears and he's showing power, he's calling down fire from heaven like Elijah did. He's making all these things happen as he speaks because remember, darkness does have power. Many people don't believe darkness has power. All them scary horror films that people watch with dolls that are able to speak, spirits have the ability to do things. You remember when Moses and Aaron went up against the uh, the, the priest or the, ma the magicians of Pharaoh, and they threw down their staff and it turned into a snake. Well, Pharaoh's people threw theirs down and it turned into a snake as well. So darkness has the ability to do these things. But yes, when the anointing of God is present, it can overpower and will overpower darkness. But when we're talking about as the church is concerned, when they see this man do these things, they're going to call him God. 
they're going to look at him as such because they haven't seen anyone else in the church realm that they've been exposed to do the things that this man is doing. It says all power with signs and lying wonders. Okay, okay. Now what we're saying, he's going to call down fire like Elijah. But when we, I don't know if we'll get to that part today, but it will get to the point where this man, the Antichrist, will be assassinated and he will be brought back to life. Okay, I don't know if we'll get to that today with the time frame I got, but we will definitely get to that in the next part, if not today. Verse 10, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Okay, so let, let me, let, let, let's get into this. Receive not the love of the truth. What does that mean? How, how, how are these people that are being deceived are in unrighteousness, not receiving the love of the truth. We have transitioned. Ephraim has to go home. God is gathering Ephraim and preparing us to go home. Now, we there's a series called, um, it's written in the volume of the book. We haven't taught on that in a while. If you have those CDs, it's good to go through those, where it walks through all the scriptures that show that this remnant called Ephraim, the ten lost tribes, are going to be gathered in the last days. Okay, Their sin of the totality of this group of people is going to be forgiven. The sin of us walking away from the covenant of God, which is what got us kicked out or scattered in the first place. And we are going to be physically brought back to the land of our forefathers. This is all scriptural. It even goes as far as to say, I believe it's in Isaiah, where it talks about the days of people and being in awe and talking about how the children of Israel came out of Egypt, which we remember in this time that we're in with Passover. Nobody's going to talk about that time anymore. It's going to be, they're going to talk about how God brought the ten lost tribes out of the nations of, of this world and brought them back to the land. This is all scriptural. The reason why I bring that up is because we say these things and because people haven't been taught the fullness of God's word through the, the material that we have in this ministry, they just hear it and be like, that's not true. That ain't going to happen. What is this dude talking about? It is scriptural. Okay? You stick around long enough, you will be taught that. Okay? And again, now the overall problem is, is that when it comes to end time prophecy, church people just think it ain't got nothing to do with them. They're excluded from that. We're the, we're the, elite, we're, we're the, uh, the elect. We're the remnant, the church. Nothing can harm us. Nothing's going to come against us. I think the comment that I get very, very often um, is that God is not going to let any of these bad things happen to his bride. These are the things that are, I'm being told. Is that scriptural? Well, we're going to find out. But the, the, that's the mindset that most church people have is, I ain't got nothing to worry about. God loves me so that none of these things that you're speaking of could ever happen to me. We're going to find out. I'm going to show you today that that's not true. The church is in trouble. That's why the prophet Todd keeps screaming, you have to separate yourself from the church, from the whore. You've got to. The church is in trouble. Yes, the people are kind. Yes, the people believe in, in, in Jesus Christ, and they're probably going to end up in heaven if they don't take that mark. But again, they're walking in a direction that is completely opposite to what God is doing. And I'm going to give you a scripture. I'm going to give you some homework, too, to go with that. Go and read that and verify what I'm saying. Okay? Verse 11. And for this cause, God shall send them, who? The people that are in deception. The people that, that, that believe that what they're doing and believing is correct. Just like all the millions of folks with the images I showed you at the beginning thought that on May the 21st, 2011, they were going to be raptured. They're being deceived. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, and they should believe a lie. Who's sending the delusion? Remember the comment that I'm getting. God wouldn't do that. He wouldn't allow that to happen. And yet, I just read in verse 11 that God is the one that is going to send the delusion. Your heart is going to be purposed. But what that means, what that looks like, is your heart is purposed. You are absolutely 100% convinced that what your pastor told you is correct. Easter's fine. Halloween's fine. They've been sent strong delusion. Verse 12, and that all might be damned who believe not the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, this is, this is scary. 
unrighteousness. What is unrighteousness? It's sin. It's anything that is not of the truth. Is it unrighteousness to not believe in the truth of God's transition? Yes. Here's your homework assignment. Get a pen, get a paper, put up a little notepad on your phone, iPad, whatever you got. Write down Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. Okay? You go read that. Isaiah 8 and 20. This is in respect to what I just said. It's an unrighteousness to not believe what God is trying to transition his people to. All right, I'll give you a cliff note. Isaiah 8.20, it says, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. This is the time that we are in. Okay? Revelation, what is it? 14.12, 12.17, and it's like 24.14, I believe, when it talks about the testimony of his son Yeshua and the covenant, the commandments of God, both being in that elect, in the remnant, the patience of the saints, those that are in the end, they need both. And if these preachers and these ministers and these pastors may have good intentions, but if they're not speaking according to the law and the testimony of Jesus, man, they're not moving in the direction of light. They're not being directed by the Spirit of God in these last days. Please let chew on that, understand that, write that scripture down and go read it. Go read the whole eight chapter of Isaiah 8. Because if that's the direction God is going in and the pastors are saying, no, no, peace, peace, none of that's going to happen. Don't worry about the commandments. Those people are deceived. That cradle of hope ministry, don't mess with them people. Go look at all the stuff online, read about it. They're not going in the direction of God. I'm giving you scripture. You pray and you fast and you figure out which way is right. Go to Revelation chapter 13, please. Revelation chapter 13. The powers of darkness. Okay, we just read. God is going to send the delusion. What does that mean? That means the powers of darkness, just like we talk about with, uh, with Job, with the purpose of temptation. God is going to permit darkness to have the authority to bring that delusion in these last days to anybody that is not accepting the truth. Revelation 13.1, okay? Let's get into some end time stuff. Revelation 13.1. And I stood up on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. I remember reading this when I was a kid. Uh, distinctly, I was like 10 years old, and I literally thought that I was going to see something that looked like this. Again, this is allegorical. It's meaning something. Okay, stick with me. Seven heads, 10 horns. Seven kings reigning over 10 regions. If you remember that first part we did when uh, we walked through and how the elite have broken up all these different countries around the world into 10 regions, and Bible talks about uh, there are going to be ten kings, but three are going to be taken over. Okay, this is what we're alluding to. Having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon the heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth was the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So the Antichrist is going to give and have power to put these people in authority, okay? And I saw one of the heads as it was wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Again, the Antichrist will be killed, and he's going to come back to life. It said his deadly wound will be healed, and all the world will wonder after the beast. Because after all, Christ died and came back to life. So if this man does it, Hey, he's got to be godly. Verse 4. And they worshiped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Nobody's going to want to fight this Antichrist character because everybody loves this guy. Mind you, this dude is walking the earth right now. Verse 5. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. 
this man is going to have power and authority for three and a half years. When you break down 40 and 42 months, it is three and a half years. Remember, the tribulation is broken up into a seven-year time slot. It begins with the signing of the peace treaty. We'll probably get to this next time. It begins when this Antichrist man negotiates a peace treaty with Israel and all the nations in the Middle East to stop the fighting. That starts that seven-year span. Three and a half years into this, he is going to lose his mind, decimate the temple of God that's going to be rebuilt, okay? And then that last three and a half years, it's going to be hell on earth, okay? Stay with me. Verse 6, and he opens his mouth and blasts in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. He's not going to miss anybody. And it was given unto him to make, get this, war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given to him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So, again, I thought the saints were going to be raptured before any of this happened. And yet the Bible is telling us that the saints, the people that have attached themselves unto the Lord God of Israel through his son, are going to be overcome. They're going to be overcome. This is scriptural. Not no rapture stuff that's going to take you off of the earth. The saints will be overcome by this man of the Antichrist. He's going to be given the authority to do that. So this guy is going to come against the saints. The pleading, the blood of Jesus, none of that stuff is going to happen. Um, let me speed up. I mean, I, I can't stress that enough. That that de that deception, that, that slumber that people are in, people in church, maybe even some Ephraimites, I don't know. We're in this position where we, we conceptually understand that the scriptures are going to happen, but for some reason, we don't think we have to do anything about it. There's no, there's no recourse. There's no consequences of us not doing anything. If you do not, I'll get to that. The saints are going to be overcome. Verse 8, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. We're going to see this happen. Whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundations of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. Please listen. That's what he's saying. If anybody is listening, listen up. Okay? The people that aren't written in the book of life are going to be the ones pointing and saying, that guy needs to be worshipped. Don't worry about this Jesus guy in the Bible and this God stuff. None of that stuff in the Bible is real. Can't be proven. Archaeological, you know, there's no, there's no evidence. There's no evidence for him, for that. I'm looking at him. I see what he did. I see how he made peace on earth. I see how he fixed the economy. I see how he stopped all the violence in all these nations, took the guns, did all these things and make it all peaceful, and everybody can come in one accord, and everybody loves everybody. Their names aren't written in a book of life. And, yeah, some of them people are going to be Christians or calling themselves Christians. Verse 10. He that is leadeth, or he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. And he that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So we're narrowing down this way of escape. We're narrow, we, we know there ain't gonna be no rapture. Okay, I beat that horse, and I'm still gonna beat that horse if I need if need be. But we see that if you pick up a gun, because I get this all the time too. I've got hundreds of these. I'm not running. I'm not leaving the United States. I'm going to take my gun and take my country back. Is that scriptural? To take the country back part, no, that's not going to happen. We're, we're, going to re, we're going to find out what happens to this country. But the picking up of a gun, the Bible just says that if you kill, we're killed with the sword. So you take that gun and you try to go do all the stuff that you're talking about doing, yeah, the Lord said you, you will be killed with that weapon that you just picked up. Not the particular weapon, but in that manner you shall be killed. Verse 11, And I beheld a beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast. So another guy's going to come, and he's going to encourage the worship of this Antichrist character, whose deadly wound was healed. Oh, that sounds Christ-like. Verse 13, And he doeth great wonders, 
so that he maketh fire come down from heaven upon the earth in the sight of men, just like Elijah did, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles with he which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image, a statue or, or whatever, a picture of the beast which had been wounded by the sword and did live. That's the third time we've read that in the last five minutes. So yes, the fact that this man is going to be mortally wounded, die and come back to life and have all the answers to everything, he's going to be worshipped as God. For by those that are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Now, I'm probably, I'm going to try to do 10 more minutes. Stick with me on this. Okay, stick with me on this. Now, we talked about the third temple being rebuilt. I want to cover some of this before I end up for tonight. That third temple, okay, the first one, uh, went away. the third temple is going to be rebuilt in Jerusalem. That time is coming. There's been millions upon millions of dollars already set aside to build that temple. They've got the plans for it. It will be the most beautiful structure ever placed upon this earth. Okay, the Lord God is going to have this done. He's going to have this rebuilt. Okay, so again, the peace accord is going to be signed. The Antichrist is going to take credit for it, swell up. I got the Middle East in peace. Ain't no more fighting. Ain't no more, you know, ISIS and, and Israel issues going on. I'm going to get it settled down. That is going to start the seven year tribulation. Three and a half years are going to go pretty smooth. And then that last three and a half is literally going to be hell on this earth. Verse 16, and he causeth all. Please listen to this part. He, the Antichrist, is going to cause everybody, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. I cannot stress this enough. Let me bring up some images. I got a couple of these I want to kind of wet the beak with. Let me see. Oops, hold on. Present to everyone. There we go. Technology, folks, technology. What you are looking at is a machine that is in some Walmart stores, okay? It's actually in some stores right now, and it's called a solo health machine, okay? Now, the two things that I have highlighted on here is a place where you put your arm in, of course, and you check your blood pressure, but then that's your left arm. But then there's a place at the bottom right for something else. Now, when I go to the next image, you'll see what for. It is to check an RFID chip placed in your right hand. The mark of the beast is already passed in law in this country. It's already in law. Has it been forced? No, not yet. But the Antichrist will do that at some point in time. But I'm trying to wake people up to the fact that the people that think they're going to be raptured and they don't have to worry about the mark, or the people that believe that I'm the apple of God's eye and I don't have to do anything to protect myself or make any plans of action. Folks, this stuff is happening before our eyes, and we got to wake up. We have to realize that we need to take action because this stuff is coming down quicker than any of us want to believe. Okay? So, again, you can go look this up yourself. These machines are in stores in this country right now, and they're preparing people to receive that mark and to be able to get all the wonderful benefits that come with receiving the mark of the beast. All the health benefits, all the, the economic benefits, all the peace that's going to come with this, this, this great solution that this man that everybody loves is going to implement. And it's already here. Verse 17, and that no man might buy or sell save that he have the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is number of a man, and everybody knows this, is 666. Okay? Let me come back to the video. Yeah, you can see me. So again, what are we going to do now? The mark of the beast is virtually here. It hasn't been enforced, but it's on the horizon. Okay, it's here. It's passed in the law. Antichrist, yeah, he's walking the earth somewhere. Okay, but he is here. Without that mark, you're not going to be able to buy, you're not going to be able to sell, you're not going to be raptured. If you don't take it, the Bible says later, you will be killed. Okay? If you do take it, many church people will take it. When you can't buy food, 
you can't go to Walmart or McDonald's or the grocery store and feed your family and you're looking at your kids and they're starving to death, uh, yeah, you're going to probably take that mark, believing that Jesus loves you and there's no way you're going to burn in hell. Write down Revelation 19.20. Bible says that if you take that mark, you will burn in hell for eternity. I don't care if you feel the Holy Ghost. I don't care if you pray 18 hours a day and you fast 29 days a month. You take that mark, it's over. So, what is our solution? I'm probably going to do this and I'll shut it down. We can't stop what the church is going to do. Okay, we've already separated ourselves from that. So this ministry, again, you need to be under a fellowship leader. Um, there are things that I cannot talk about on video. So you need to reach out and you need to be under um, the authority of a fellowship leader or um, under one of the, if you're fortunate enough to be under one of these prophets and correspond with them directly, uh, take that privilege, do that. And they'll be able to help you through what you need to do as it pertains to what we're talking about. But we've been making um, plans for over the years um, for a place of refuge outside of the United States of America. That's all I'll say as far as I'll go. Um, but we have a plan of action, and I'm encouraging everyone, as well as myself, because I'm doing the same things you know, that, that we're talking about, to begin to put together an exit strategy. Okay, And these are things you can do. These are things that, that we will need to do because, again, these things are in motion. Darkness has already put these things in motion that we're reading about. So it's not a time of, oh, it's going to happen sometime down the line. It's happening. So if they're moving, we need to be moving. They're in action, we need to be taking action. All right? And, and, and I thank God that we have the ability and the time to do that. Um, and, you know, the first thought that comes up is, you know, that's great. That sounds great. I don't have any money. Recently, I heard Prophet Todd minister, I believe, what's today, Friday? I think this was Wednesday. Um, you can go back uh, Wednesday, and Prophet Todd was talking about this, and he talked about we need to watch that spirit of poverty that is on many of us as Ephraimites. And I used to always remember Prophet Decker would minister, and he said that if the easiest way to solve a spirit of poverty upon you is to go out and get two jobs, get three jobs. And that's going to break your mindset out of, I can only have so much, or God's not able to give me the resources I need to get done what he's already put in Scripture, which we'll find out next week uh, when we go into that about the remnant and them escaping the things that are coming. So again, use your faith, begin to speak, and thank God for helping you to get out of this country, to get to safety. Begin to thank God every day for that. And begin to take action, small steps. You know, Monique and I have been, you know, selling stuff that we got in the house that we don't need. Um, if, I, if I'm looking around and I got little electronics or little things that I haven't touched in six, eight months, sell it. Put it on eBay. Sell it. Put the money aside. These are things that we can, small steps that we can do to prepare ourselves um, to leave and to have that, be a part of that great exodus that, that the Bible talks about. So I will cut it off right there. I think we're running up on good timing. Um, as the sun is going down, the Passover is beginning to start. Um, get the leaven out of your homes. Begin to eat unleavened bread for the next uh, the next week or so. Clean out the leaven that you got in your house. Throw it away. We'll check my refrigerator. Make sure I ain't got no fries or anything stuffed in there from the kids. But enjoy this time. Enjoy this week. Enjoy this festival. Um, remember our forefathers and what they went through and how God brought them out. And rejoice that God is bringing us out uh, in a mighty way as well. So love you guys. We will see you next Shabbat next week.